Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation today on Advanced Steel Collaboration Part 2. My name is John Bennett and I work for Greatech as a Customer Success Manager and Application Engineer. So hopefully everybody's uh, logged in. We're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to kick straight into today's presentation. Um, so we're sort of following on from uh, last week. So today's presentation will follow on from that. Just a little bit about me, first of all, my background. Obviously, I've been involved in structural engineering for quite a while. Uh, started on the drawing board a very long time ago. Uh, progressed to sort of working with CAD, 2D CAD, then into 3D CAD. Then I came into work for what's called the channel. So I came to work for Grey Tech, uh, primarily with Advanced Steel. And now we're sort of seeing a slight change, move, collaboration between Advanced Steel and Revit become more prevalent. So I tend to work across a couple of different platforms, trying to help companies to find better ways to integrate uh, Autodesk solutions and Great Tech solutions into their fabric. So before we kick into the rest of it, just to note, there should be a, uh, a copy of today's presentation in the handouts at the bottom of it. You should be able to download it. That's a PDF, but we'll have some hyperlinks in it as well. Uh, you'll note then when I go through the presentation, you should be able to access those afterwards uh, to get to various help pages, videos, etc. So this is uh, sort of number three in a series of webinars that we've been doing. Um, we have another one to come next week as well. So I'm sort of doing part two to still uh, sort of collaboration now between Revit and Advanced Steel. Uh, the handout should have some links to the previous recordings. You will need to go and register if you haven't seen those before. Uh, hopefully you've had a copy of that and you should be able to access that. So the first part, we sort of looked at the, the extension file itself, how it works, the different types of formats, how it's evolved and changed. Uh, the transfer methods appropriately and then we had a little bit of a sort of discussion around materials and their mapping etc and creating materials inside Revit and appropriate materials inside Advanced Steel. So today we're sort of in the part two version of this so we're going to look at some approved families a bit more the transfer a little bit more background behind the steel connections how those have sort of changed uh, in the interoperability in 2019 between Advanced Steel and Revit um, and look at the fabrication format and what is transferred backwards and forwards during that. And then hopefully along the way, I'll try and impart a few tips and tricks uh, that we found during this process of trying to work with this new interoperability between the softwares. So the first part of that was um, about stealing a pre-families. I sort of touched on this last week, uh, saying that you should make use of the approved families inside Revit. So these are families that have the sex and key name stored in them. Um, they started coming in sort of two or three years ago. Uh, in 18, they were a little bit difficult to find. They, I think they came as part of the uh, sort of midterm update. And I actually found the link via a blog link that was on an Autodesk website. I've, I've put that in the, in, in the PowerPoint today. So it should also be a hyperlink for you. And this was basically to enable mapping of standard steel shapes backwards and forwards to approved families. So these are families that match between the two different platforms. In 2019, it's a bit easier to do that. Um, you, you don't actually have to go and install all the families. They actually come pre-installed and actually under the RVT libraries inside the system. Um, and there's some very good help on how to do that. And especially on you know tips and tricks as well on families and categories. Uh, so I would try and advise you to try and use the standard steel shapes and families where possible because it just makes the mapping a lot easier. They have this the section key, which we spoke about last week in, in part one in there. So I, I'm being told my slideshow is not working today, so that's uh, that's not good. So uh, let me just try and see if I can restart that. So hopefully you can see the slides again this time. I think Rob might be listening. If you put something in the chat window, that would help me, mate. So, okay, I do apologize for that. My One of my colleagues was watching in the background in case we had a technical difficulty. So, just go through that again. So, obviously, uh, hopefully you can see the slides now that are working with that. So, 
this is the bit I was just talking about, which was the uh, approved families part of the system. So, and just to recap, the N19, they are actually, they come installed, so you don't have to go and find them. So it's a lot easier. Um, and just try and work with those. I found it a lot easier in the transfer between the different systems. So a little bit about connections here. So um, they've sort of been around for the last couple of years. They've sort of started creeping into Revit and these are advanced steel connections. So the ones of you today that are familiar with advanced steel will be familiar with these connections. And they basically, they've linked the, the standard connections that we see in advanced steel into Revit. And this just makes it a lot easier with the interoperability between the different softwares. Um, and, and the format and what you see is exactly the same in the, in the two platforms. So if you're an experienced advanced steel user, you've actually got a head start over someone who actually works with Revit because they won't have seen this format before. So you can create your connection in advanced steel or you can create it in Revit and you should be able to transfer it backwards and forwards. Um, I do tend to load them all myself into my template. I don't want to load individual connections and try and find them. I just go and load them all at the start. I think I probably said that last week in my presentation last week. So there were some new tools that came into Revit in 2019. We saw a new uh, steel toolbar ribbon tab however you want to term it, came in. Um, and this basically brought in a series of tools that for those people who work with advanced steel, they would be familiar with those tools. So these are all the primary tools that you actually use to create plates, bolts, welds. And then there's sort of elements, they call them modifiers in advanced steels. I call them features in uh, sort of modifiers and Revit uh, features in advanced steel. And Basically, they equate between the two different platforms. So you can cut the corner of a plate off, put a notch in, a shortening, and a contour cut. So these kind of tools weren't available before in the 2018 version, but now we see a definite change and a more better integration to enable you to build the basic building blocks of steel fabrication elements that we would do at a detail level, traditionally inside the advanced steel platform. So now you have the ability to do that with inside the Revit platform to build your own connections, to, to, to draw your own plates properly. And this is quite a big change because before there was all kinds of ways to get around that, doing different, in, you know, installing extra apps, etc. And then there was always a problem of getting it downstream into the fabricator and to the detailer to complete the project. So now this gives you uh, the engineer or the engineering technician the ability to be able to create those kind of custom connections, which they can also send out to a third party to actually get designed for a design analysis. And that can be done by another series of programs. There's a couple of other different softwares available that allow that. And again, it's, it's sort of focused the point of a collaboration method between different platforms and different tool sets to enable you to do this and uh, also you can create a connection of something that you build manually so if you get a non-standard connection so the previous slide was all about standard connections and now you can build this custom connection inside Revit and then you can actually copy it around in the model so that that's a vast improvement from where we thought where we were before um, uh, a colleague of mine or ex-colleague of mine I used to work with this guy at uh, Autodesk so he um, he wrote an interesting article on it, um, so I put his uh, blog link down in here, and I actually cribbed one of his uh, one of his images here, which I put in as well today. So this also leads to the what's called the steel fabrication format, which we'll come on to in a minute, which is a slight change again in how Revit deals with structural steel beams. So with this, I'm just going to run this uh, sort of video that I did. So for those who watched last week, you'll be familiar with this. This is my simple little test model, which throughout the whole of this, you know, prepping for this and uh, this, you know, trying to sort of test what was going on, how it was working. I, I started off some very simple models. It was, it, I didn't see the point of trying to create really complicated stuff uh, that people couldn't see what was going on. So we sort of went through this so this is obviously the steel ribbon and in here i'm going to sort of create and apply a connection i'm going to go and set the connection 
So you can apply the connection first and then choose the connection type afterwards. I tend to do it the other way around because in advanced steel, that's the way I do it. I tend to select the connection type first and then apply it to the element. Uh, you can do it either way around inside Revit. So with this, uh, this connection applied, it obviously uh, put a base plate on there, which for those of you familiar with advanced steel, that's sort of one of the very primary connections that we actually use. And we can see it here listed here. Um, I'm, I'm sort of reapplying it to another joint in the system as well. So this, uh, I didn't actually change the parameters of this joint. I just reapplied it in a different place. Um, I'm going to go and apply, I think, an end plate connection now between these uh, column and this beam. So for those of you who work with advanced steel, this is the kind of thing at a detail level that you would do sort of quite regularly and you would quite happily sort of add these in and copy them around. So the ability now exists within the software, within the Revit platform to do exactly the same thing. And this is quite a big leap in technology change really because it was quite difficult to do this at this level and to have this, this functionality within even just standard parameters. So here we're going to the modify parameters, which is actually going to open the joint dialogue. So the joint dialogue is the dialogue that you would normally see in advanced steel as well. And the, the, for those of you who've used advanced steel, you would be very, very familiar with this. In fact, it is virtually identical, probably apart from a slight change to the colors and the actual sort of structure. But fundamentally, the, the tabs down the left hand side is what we use. And then all the individual uh, field dialogue entries you can put in over on the right side of the panel with a little descriptive image of what's going on in the joint. And then obviously you get the interaction and the change in the elements you actually see in the model. Uh, you can work this in a 3D view. Obviously, uh, a lot of people are traditional work in a 2D view inside uh, Revit, but obviously I'm from Advanced Steel, so I tend to use to working in a 3D view and putting in the elements that I need and then adjusting them. So that's all I'm doing here. It's exactly the same thing as what I would do in Advanced Steel. This is the kind of thing that we would do in day in, day out as a detailer. So the ability now resides in this platform to do that. And then the ability also resides to transfer this downstream into a detailing platform to complete. So the philosophy might be that the, the engineer or the technician might put in a few examples of what is required and what is needed for the detail, but they probably don't need to put every single one in, but at least the intent is then shown inside a model and not conveyed in a series of drawings that then someone has got to then translate again and re-put all that data back in. So here I'm just going through the export dialogue here again. So I'm just checking the settings and I'm going to press the export button. And I'm going to send this down via the SML transfer file, which again, we explained the different formats of that last week. So we go in, we save the file here and give it a slightly different name. So here I've just swapped to the advanced steel platform. I'm just creating a new template. So I've opened the template file to create a new DWG project. I'm going to run to the uh, import button here. I'm going to select the SMLX file. Those of you who watched last week will obviously be aware of this. This is the standard method to send backwards and forwards. A little quirk inside uh, Revit, uh, for some reason they call plates metal deck. Um, I didn't have a mapping in place uh, and I didn't actually change the material. You can actually change the material inside Revit to a more appropriate plate material. So in here, I'm just obviously accessing the materials dialog and I'm, I think I pick S355 or 275, I can't, can't remember now. But um, I just picked one just to create a mapping because uh, there wasn't one in existence. So we see that's come across into advanced steel and we can see it's brought the joint in. Obviously we still got access to the beam library here. Um, so you will notice a slight difference here as well. I think if I actually pick this, the, the second beam here, you'll probably see, or the column especially, you'll see a change in the, in the dialogue, I think. So here it's actually similar to what you would see as a dynamic transfer. OK, so when I was I talked about this last week where it was used for special connections or special profiles in Revit uh, when they transfer into advanced steel. So this does actually happen when you apply a connection to it. It transfers it into this like dynamic format, but it's actually what they're calling the fabrication format. So it actually changes the beam inside uh, how the beam is seen inside Revit. And then obviously when it comes across into advanced steel, um, 
I haven't seen any issue with this uh, from what we've done, uh, what we've tested. Uh, we can still add connections, we can still carry on working with it, we can still produce drawings, etc. It's just a slightly different work, different sort of workflow being applied. Um, uh, it's obviously been done for a reason to make the interoperability easy between the two platforms. So obviously the, all the connections came across, they were all, all intact there as well. You see all the, the different colors and layers and that's because uh, obviously we use object layer assignment. Uh, it's actually done by the elements actually inside the management tool. So we actually set that up. Uh, just one thing to watch out for, I would just advise you, just watch out for the Z offsets. Um, we did note that they, they are moving those in, in, in the transfer. Obviously if you've got typically an advanced deal, we would model with the system line at the top for a horizontal beam in the middle for a column so it shouldn't affect you unless you change the section size you might need to go and adjust the offset then but fundamentally if it's coming from the engineer and the sizing is correct and you don't need to make any changes we we think it's quite okay to work in this manner we don't see a problem with that So to explain a little bit more behind the uh, fabrication transfer and what, what's actually happening there and why is, why is it coming in. So in the 19 version, this was new. I hadn't seen this before. I hadn't, well, I hadn't, certainly hadn't seen it in the 18 version from what I could tell. And this is because of the introduction of the new steel toolbar that we saw at the top, the ribbon tab at the top. And obviously it changes the way that you do copes and cuts, etc., and shortenings. And features that we take for granted in advanced steel were always treated slightly different inside Revit. And obviously with the introduction of those tools, which have come from advanced steel, I think this has led to obviously the introduction of this new steel fabrication format to cope with these new elements. Basically, if you apply those tools there from the steel ribbon, it then changes the beam inside Revit from what I understand. It actually becomes a steel fabrication beam, not a normal structural steel beam. So this is, uh, and it uses what's called a steel fabrication shape. Uh, so it's a more exact profile. Um, at the moment, uh, there, there was also slight difference in the supported shapes between the two different versions, between 18 and 19. I, I expect the number of supported shapes will increase in the next version. Um, I, from what I've tested and what I understand, uh, this, when you actually do this inside Revit, uh, even if you delete the connection afterwards, so if you put a base plate on a column and then take it off, the actual beam actually stays as a fabrication beam, so steel fabrication element. So it, it's it's an irreversible process. I, I don't see any negative uh, anything at all uh, negative about this. Uh, it's just a slightly different oper operation, and I believe it's a positive step in the right direction to allow us to more collaboration and interoperability between the two software platforms. So again, I've put some help links in there. All these blue things are sort of hyperlinks. So you can look at those afterwards and go and see if you can uh, sort of get a bit clearer understanding yourself. So please do do that. I mean, it's a lot to convey in a couple of slides today. Uh, there was a, This was quite a big change and I was quite surprised to see it. Uh, it took me a little while myself to get my head around it. So obviously, Throughout the couple of presentations, we had a, a number of things that we sort of noted uh, from my side, uh, obviously being an advanced and experienced advanced steel user, but maybe not necessarily an experienced Revit user and, and vice versa, a, a few things that we see that, that people don't always do. Uh, they might sound really obvious, but um, one of them was the origin. People really struggle to find the origin. So there's a thing in Revit, you unhide the hidden elements, you can see the origin. So I actually just put a little manual detail in so I knew where it was. And when you've seen me do the, the video today, you'll see it's been in the corner of the file that I created. Obviously, I customized the file that I created as, as my template as well. And I think I've said before, uh, things like sections and families, I've sort of loaded them in to the template. I mean, I have found during the mapping, uh, when I actually uh, transfer a file from Advanced Deal into Revit, Providing you're using an approved family in, you know, using standard families inside uh, advanced steel, which we call sections and profiles when they come into Revit as families, 
you don't actually have to have all the families loaded it will pull them in because it actually sort of sort of collates that library when you first run the smlx transfer so this this is um this is quite good but again you only tend to get what you bring in so i found it was easier to probably just to load everything in my template so that i had the full library of all the steel sections that were approved so i didn't have to go off and keep loading families to find the particular section size i wanted no that makes the file a little bit bigger but that's the way i was used to working inside advanced steel having full access to a library other things to sort of watch out for is levels um, I did find that transferring from Advanced Steel into Revit, it was probably easier just to have one level and vice versa. If you're actually in Revit, uh, obviously make sure you use levels. It's quite a primary thing that is used inside Revit. And when you put the beam on it, try not to do a large offset from it. I found that didn't come across too well when I came back into Advanced Steel. So we tend in Advanced Steel to put the beam on the level. And we actually do that via our Project Explorer. So similar to what you see inside Revit, we have a sort of structure there that you can apply. Uh, you put the beam on the level, it's actually linked to the level. If you move the level, the beam moves with it. And it's the same sort of thing applies inside Revit as well. But people do tend to have seen the more traditional ways to put then an offset from that level. I would probably not do that. I would probably create a structural level for the beam. It might be different to the structural floor level. And, and grids are transferable. Uh, they will come across from, from Revit into Advanced Steel. We do treat grids slightly different in Advanced Steel, but uh, you can transfer them across. Um, I would only put them at one level. <laughs> that was what I would say. Obviously, you only need them at level one in Revit. It tends to project, it projects the grid up to the multiple levels inside the model. If you do it in Advanced Steel and have multiple grid levels, if you're sending it out from Advanced Steel to Revit, probably just transfer the grid at the bottom don't transfer all the different grids at all the different levels. It can lead to a bit of confusion. So a few more ideas here. Um, so in this one, uh, we talk about, you know, the creation elements. So steel connections inside Revit. I, I've probably said it before and I'm going to say it again. I just load all of them. Uh, as a detailer, I don't want to be trying to find them and load them and unload them. I just load them all. Uh, they're, they're all in there. I can use the search filter to find what it was. If I've come from advanced steel, I'm familiar with the terminology. I'm used to having the whole library available. Um, steel materials, I've said this before in the first, uh, first PowerPoint uh, presentation we did. I would just try and make sure that you get the right materials inside Revit that you're going to sort of appropriate across into advanced steel. If you're working inside a company and it's quite easy to just talk to each other and have that obviously it's slightly difficult if you're external but maybe try and use more appropriate steel materials relative to current steel grades that are available for people to buy and what would be used at a detail level because this actually cuts down on the mapping as well it makes the mapping easier when you're transferring backwards and forwards i showed that in last week's presentation so I would just watch your materials, make a note of them. And if you are working with an external resource, maybe just tell him what you've done with the materials so that when he comes to bring in your SMLX file, he can have already created the material. So if it's something different or something not standard that you're using, he can then create that inside at Band Steel and it just makes it easier to map it in. Um, colors um, we use colors and layers quite a bit in, in advanced steel not quite the same inside Revit I did actually use the colors inside the materials and also some of the visual graphics and overrides to do with connections to make it easier for me to tell the difference between various material types and actually highlight the connection elements I found it a little bit difficult to see what was a connection element when I first did it because they all looked exactly the same. You'll notice in some of the videos that I've done, the, the connections tend to come in a magenta color. I'm not saying you need to do that. I'm just saying I did that as my personal view just to make it easier for me to see what was going on as I was slightly unfamiliar with the platform. Um, and also, as I said, materials, you can change the basic color of it. It, it doesn't affect it in the, obviously, you can make it look like a piece of steel if you want to in the higher level of presentation, but in the basic sort of view, shaded views, I sort of saw it as a different color. It just, again, it was just something I was used to seeing inside at Band Steel, and it works slightly differently. Also, I found it quite, quite useful to set my template as the default, so I created my own 
Revit template with my background and stuff. I just tried to make my environment feel familiar to me. And then I set that as the default template in the background. Okay, so this is more to do with advanced steel. Uh, one of the things that comes up quite a bit, uh, there's a setting, especially in the UK, um, I would change this setting, okay, to make sure that when I actually export it, and make sure it's set to this. That way you don't need to number the model. Sometimes you get the thing cannot be created, okay? And it, it, it means it's just because the model always has to be numbered and you can get around it by just changing that value in the system. If you're using levels inside advanced steel, obviously use them via the project explorer, make sure the beams are attached to them. If they're attached to them, when you transfer it to Revit, the levels will come across into Revit. Um, obviously just make sure in the Revit file that you're bringing it in, possibly only have the base level in, don't have multiple levels in. I've found sometimes it does get confused and you end up with a few offsets from the actual level to the actual beam position. And obviously try and work about the origin in both platforms. It just makes it a lot easier to transfer. In advanced steel, we can give it a different level just because you model it at zero doesn't mean that it's at zero. You can give it a level of 50 meters if you want to. And there's similar kinds of offsets available within the coordinate system inside Revit as well. So I would encourage you to just use those basic principles and use, use levels inside advanced steel, use the project explorer, use your origin and just watch out for your defaults. So this one I talk about this, this is uh, sort of workflow concepts and this is what is all this has been about. And there was some recent, some blog, blog posts that were done by Autodesk and I put a couple of hyperlinks in there. And this basically explains the process that we've been trying to demonstrate today. So this is coming from analysis into design, into detailing and now labeling interoperability between the two. And then going right down to the fabrication drawings at the end from the detail program. So this is a collaborative workflow between different products. And this is what it's all about. It's not just working in one different silo and being responsible for one element. It's trying to collaborate between different disciplines. And at an earlier stage, get the detail into the model, which can then stop some of those things that happen further down the road. I mean, how many steelwork detailers, me included, you get the project at the last minute, you put your connections in and then you, you're going back to the engineer and the architect and they're going, oh, you can't have that in there because we've got this ducts coming through here or there's this pipe coming through there. And you're saying, well, that's what I need for an engineering point of view. And then all kinds of collaboration and meetings, RFIs, backwards and forwards and discussion. How much easier is it to try and tackle those issues at the earlier stage of the stream and the workflow? So this is what the whole concept of this is about. It's not about replacing anyone's job. It's actually about trying to make everybody work better and closer together. And it also enables a detailer to work at a technician level inside an engineering practice. So your services can be utilized earlier in the workflow. So don't look at it as like, oh, you know, this is gonna take my job away. And this was an analogy that was put, I went to a conference recently. It's not going to take my job away. It's more about changing my job, changing my role, enabling me to work in a different aspect and work in a more collaborative workflow, collaborative environment. And I know that might facilitate some contractual changes and things in the way we work, but for our project, you do build relationships and you do work with people. So I would try and embrace this. And I mean, and the, the workflow is outlined in these couple of blog posts of what they're trying to achieve. And it's a very clear indication to me of what Autodesk are trying to do, change the way that we work and evolution. And that is the way we've always worked. You know, we, we all started off, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, they probably drew things on the ground or on the wall. We then eventually got to using drawing boards and things like that. Then we went to 2D CAD systems, then we then went to modeling systems, and now we're doing collaboration through BIM, et cetera, and managing complete projects and creating them in virtual worlds before we actually start. And we are just part of that process. So that's my personal view. Um, just try and embrace the workflow changes and the collaboration methods.
So I just wanted to, uh, a little reminder, and we come towards the end of today. Uh, Rob's got one more session coming up where he's going to go actually into the fabrication part of this. So coming out of Revit into Advanced Steel and obviously going into the fabrication details, doing a few drawings, etc., and showing that. Okay, so that's coming up next week. So a little sort of reminder of that. So please, please come along and watch that one. So I'm actually going to just uh, play this. Uh, this is something I actually did this this morning. So before I, I decided to change the slide, the previous slide, I was going to use that one. And I thought I'd change it to this one. This is a connection that I actually did. Uh, someone uh, asked a forum question a while ago about creating a custom connection inside advanced deal to do a connection between two box sections for a roof pad and he couldn't find anything how he wanted it so i did create something inside here inside advanced deal and i could turn this into a custom connection inside advanced deal for those of you familiar with that there's obviously little building blocks elements available to make it easier to do that you turn it into a custom connection template and you save it so i thought well i'll just see what comes across and i know i tried this before in previous versions so I created the SMLX file and obviously then I dragged it into Revit using that format. So when it comes across in here, I see this here and obviously I get quite a high level of detail and I knew that this element is actually a joint. So this element was actually the end plate joint inside Advanced Steel and it's pulled it across into, into Revit. So this has all come across in, but even all the other bits that I may have done them with some sort of uh, building blocks inside the custom connections inside Advanced Steel, but at least all the elements transferred across. And here again, I've, I'm sort of just quickly showing the joint dialog box. So I've got the same dialog that I saw in Advanced Steel. And when that's available in here, I can actually sort of uh, turn that into a custom connection. So what I, I'm just going to copy the uh, primary elements across in the model. So I'm just going to copy these beams across and then I'm actually going to take that joint and use the custom connection now available inside Revit 2019. And this, this was not available before this version. So you can take all these bits that I, I, I did bring them in from Advanced Steel, I must admit, but this is the point is collaboration, working together. So we just select a connection, leave it to generic and you select the input elements. So very similar, you know, first primary beam, secondary beam. So you just select them in an order that you want. Uh, you can change the order if you're not happy with that. I mean, you can move, drag the pointers around, but I sort of left it like that. I then go to customize and then give it a suitable name. So obviously SHS Pearl into raft or something. I think I'll type in here. Just because I don't type very fast. Um, and then um, obviously with that in place, that is you know, sort of select the elements. So I just put a window selection, finish the selection box, and we can see they actually changed in color. That's because they're now in the connection. Remember I said I set connections to show visual graphics to a different color, so magenta in this case. So I know this is a customized connection. And I get things like, you know, approval status, stuff like that. I can change those kind of parameters and the, the image sort of changes slightly as well. So that is now stored in my model. It's actually stored in this project and I can then actually use that. So I'm just gonna go back and I'm actually gonna sort of select that and I'm gonna actually type it in the list cause I know, know what I called it. So I just type something in there and it'll probably shortcut straight to that. So it's just like selecting a connection and then I just run through using the tab to obviously, or sorry, the control button to add the different sections that I want, finish that selection method. And we can see that that connection is applied. So this is just really to reinforce what I'm saying. It's just it's just about collaborating. I mean, you could do that in advance still, you could bring it into Revit. And then in a minute, what I'll probably do is I'm actually gonna send this out by the SMLX file again. So I'm gonna send it by the transfer, I'm gonna export it, and then I'm gonna bring it back into advanced still. So collaboration workflow. So this is the kind of thing someone might detail, might deal a really complex connection inside Revit, which they didn't have the ability to do before. They do now. You would traditionally have to recreate all that again inside advanced steel by looking at a bunch of drawings to figure out what you were doing so i've just selected a, a normal default template file again i'm going to go to the import button and i'm going to pull it in so i'm just going to select the file that i created just go open and we can see that that comes across in here I probably still got my end plate connection in, intact. I probably wouldn't have, I didn't have all the little building bricks that I, I used under custom connection inside it, but still, but at least I got everything in there that I could then do something with. I could either 
change it or create it into a custom connection if I wanted to. And also the approval status was there as well. So that was sort of really just to, to bring it all together really and just show you interoperability collaboration between Revit and Advanced Steel improved a lot in 2019. So there's a little link at the bottom of that it should be in the PDF that you've got with it. You should be able to go and watch that again if you want to as well. That brings to sort of a close today's presentation. I hope you found it uh, hopeful. Apologies for the slight mishap at the start of it today. Um, if there's any questions, I will try and follow them up afterwards. If you want to send me a question, my email is at the bottom of the bottom of the thing there. It will be in the PDF as well. Please reach out to me or Rob at Grey Tech. We're quite happily sort of help you answer your questions. And obviously we're, we're looking to try and help people move forward with this change in technology. Thank you very much.